Cybos. Enabling the digital economy. All right, welcome everyone. Hope you had an enjoyable lunch. Um, we're going to spend the next hour talking about cybersecurity and about how you put a price on that. How do you measure and communicate um, cyber risk? Um, and uh, we're going to focus on a, a couple of practical examples. We're going to focus on some of the underlying technology that you might need to, su um, to support that. Um, so as an introduction, I'm Anthony Robinson. I'm a partner in our financial, EY's financial services business um, based in Australia. Um, I'll get Ian and, and Brett to introduce themselves and then we'll kick off into the content. Uh, hi, my name's Ian Cameron. I'm the executive manager for cybersecurity strategy and, and governance for IAG. And I'll share some insights uh, around the, the partnership that we had with EY in respect to this topic. Thanks, Ian. I'm Brett Squires, partner with EY, Data and Analytics. I do a lot of work with Anthony around um, cyber so, um, and focused on banking and capital markets. All right. Excellent. All right. Well, let's kick off. Um, so what we, um, what we want to do to begin is I want to talk a little bit about our observations of what we currently do with regard to communicating cyber risk. So when we talk about putting a, a price on it, that's really about trying to change the conversation that we're having with executives and with the board to be able to make real risk-based decisions um, around cybersecurity. So today, if I just share some, some observations, a lot of our communication is based upon fear. And I'm a cybersecurity guy. I've been working in the industry for nearly 15 years. And we still have a tendency to try and tell everyone how bad everything is, how many, um, what are the latest breaches and the, the, the volumes of data that have been exfiltrated from organisations, the scale of um, attacks and, and, and losses and impacts to business. So in banking, I, I feel like we, we need to move past that. We sort of get that that there is a significant challenge in cyber that we need to address, and um, our organisations are actually taking action to try and address that. So I think we've fundamentally got to move um, the conversation beyond, beyond fear. Second piece is related to um, opinion. So when we talk to boards about um, cyber security, a lot of it, there's concern that we're not in risk appetite. And yet the, the ability for you to be able to measure when you're in or out of risk appetite is primarily driven by opinion. And that's expert opinion, both internal and external. And a lot of that opinion is based upon what everyone else is doing. No one wants to be the slowest gazelle in the pack that's going to get eaten by the cyber criminal. So there's, this, uh, there's an opinion about whether we're doing enough to, to stay, to, to not be the laggard. But it's not really measuring our risk and it's not really making sure that we're focusing our investments in the right place. Number two, um, it's about cyber technology. We get, a, we get a sense of assurance or reassurance that we're improving our risk because we're doing a bunch of stuff. We're investing in new technologies. We're putting in place new controls and protections. And surely that's improving our risk position. You know? And the reality is it is. But unless those, those capabilities that we're investing in are appropriately deployed across the business and targeting your, your key systems, then are you really buying down risk or are you just spending a lot of money building capability and, and getting new toys in place? Um, and lastly, you know, we still see a focus on compliance. You know, are we PCI compliant? How are we going with, with MAS? You know, are we you know, even compliant with, you know, the SWIFT CSP um, program or with um, the, in Australia, the, the new payments platform and so on, you know? And frankly, I think we, we really can do better than that and I think we have to do better than that as an industry. So, um, I think the key to success, though, is to make, sh make sure we can answer the right questions. You know, there's a whole bunch of, um, or a whole range of stakeholders that are interested in and have a role to play in mitigating cyber risk. And they are, that's not just the CISO, and it's not just the board, and it's not just the CEO, but it's the CRO, it's the IT service owners, it's the business owners for, for business divisions that, that have a role to play. You know, and so we need to be able to answer the questions around, are we protecting our, 
are we really protecting our critical assets? You know, how good uh, is our ability to protect our highest value um, business functions? You know, and um, are our security initiatives actually en enabling our business? And are they are they really focusing on buying down cyber risk, or are we just spending a lot of money um, gaining assurance from it? And then ultimately, can we really identify where our gaps are and who we who we can hold to account? You know, if we can answer those questions, then we're going a long way forward in improving the way that we we measure, communicate. Um, our, our cyber risk and make proper risk-based decisions. So, in terms of where, where we think we need to be, and I'm going to talk in a little while about some of the practicalities of how you do that and how we've been doing that um, with clients. You know, first and foremost, we need to align our language around cyber with the business. So, we need to be able to talk in in dollar terms and v the value at risk from the residual risk that we face. And Ian's going to talk about exactly how um, uh, IAG have done that and how they, that's transformed their ability to communicate with the board around cyber. Secondly, we, we need to be able to move from reacting to issues and incidents to being able to predict where, our, where those, those might occur. And that, that's qu quite important in understanding where your key areas of risk are in, in your business today because it allows you to put in mitigating sensors and, and detection mechanisms that mean you can start, you can, you can react before you end up with an actual event and a business disruption. And then lastly, you need data to be able to drive a lot of those decisions. And so having and ha seeing this problem as a data problem and an analytics problem helps you to be able to have the tools and, and solutions to be able to achieve the, the, the first two. Right, so let's, let's move on to some, some, some structures of how we might actually go about doing um, quantifying um, cyber risk. So we would argue that, you know, today we use metrics and, and to, to communicate to uh, executives of the board. But frankly, I think we need to turn our thinking on its head, turn our thinking upside down in terms of how we approach that problem. We have typically done that based upon the, the data we can get from the security controls that we have. And we've looked at what metrics we can get from that. And then we've sort of worked through how do we aggregate that? How do we, how do we summarize that in a way that allows us to communicate cyber risk upwards? And frankly, that means we're really only communicating what we can measure. And um, equally, we're only communicating what we can measure that we think someone might be interested in. You know, we've got to turn that on, a, on its head and, and start with the right end in mind and focus on a top-down view of what do we need to communicate and how do we measure that in terms of the, the um, controls and the, the, the data that sit underneath that. You know, and so some examples of, of what that might look like um, is we need to make sure that we're focusing on, on key threat and business disrup disruption scenarios. The board want to know how well protected are we against, you know, a, a, an Uber attack or, a, um, a, you know, just, just today I think there was a, announced a, a, an issue at, at, um, at uh, Cathay Pacific. You know, they, they're the things they see in the press day to day. They talk to other, um, other boards and, and, and directors on, on other organisations. They see this and they want to know how well protected are we. So we're going to start with that threat scenario, decompose that where we, where into the, the, the assets and the, that are going to be, need to be protected from those scenarios and the controls that then um, um, actually provide that protection. And in an ideal world, when we talk about those threat scenarios, we should be able to communicate, well, what if they were to, to um, play out in our business, what would be the value at risk that we have today? So that's not just saying what are the business impacts. It's also saying, well, we have a roadmap of, of investment going forward that we think is important to buy down risk. We need to be able to understand how that's improving our our risk position, it's improving our value at risk, it's reducing our value at risk over, over time, so that we're not putting a $5 million fence around a $1 million horse. 
Now, I, I think clearly in, in banking, we're probably a long way from that. But I think at the moment, there's a real disconnect between what we invest, where we invest it, and actually what the risk outcome is. So, um, in, in terms of achieving that, um, talk you through a couple of things that, that um, are required. So, we, we talked about starting with the threats. We talked about decomposing those into controls. And, and then about how we, how we um, map or identify and map key metrics that help us to be able to measure the effectiveness of those controls in mitigating those threats. And I think one of the key elements to focus on there is looking at the coverage that we have of those controls across those assets. So I mentioned at the beginning, we get a lot of, I think, a false sense of security in, or a false sense of assurance in that the investments we're making in new cyber capabilities. But so often they are deployed and cover a small subset of the key assets within, you know, within an institution. And we've, we've, by driving a view, a data view, a metrics view, we, we really get a um, visibility of that. Therefore, it enables us to understand the residual risk position and make the right um, decisions around that. But in order to, to do that, we also need an aggregation model. We need a mathematical model that helps us to understand how those controls um, contribute to the mitigation of risk. And, you know, th there, are, there are methods and approaches to, to dealing with, it, with that. We've worked with, with several banks to be able to, to enable that. And in doing that, you're able to simplify the communication upwards. You're able to communicate where the risk position is across different business units. You're able to drill down into the, the gaps in control coverage in either business units or the controls themselves. And it allows you to focus on taking the, the right set of actions to help you to, to, to mitigate risk. Okay? But clearly you can't do that unless you have the data. And Brett's going to talk to us later about the sort of the analytics platforms that are required underneath, underneath this to be able to drive a, a lot of it. And I think a, a key point to note around that is you want to be reusing the same data set that you're using to report um, from an operational point of view, as the, the data set that you're using to provide an aggregated view of risk. Because you know? they're fundamentally, they're, they're different lenses on the, on the same data. So I'll, um, I'll stop there and hand over to, to Ian, who's going to talk us through how IAG have, have um, executed on, uh, on calculating and measuring the, the value at risk and how that's impacted their communication with the board. Mm. Ian. Thank you, Anthony. So I'll walk you through the, the journey that, that we had. So back in late 2015, early 2016, our, our board set the challenge for us to uplift our cybersecurity capabilities. There was a, a growing concern uh, and, and questions being asked about how prepared were we, uh, how well positioned were we to identify and, and protect ourselves uh, and how effective would we be at detecting and, and responding and recovering from the cyber threats, especially in light of the, the view that our business, like many others, was embarking on a, a digital transformation journey, so the risks were, were only going to increase. So we'd already started the journey of, of making a significant in investment in uplifting our, our capabilities in terms of our, our people and skills, our, our procedures and investments in technology. Uh, but we could already anticipate that we were going to have to try and at some point uh, address the concerns of the board uh, about how effective we were at, at reducing that risk uh, and how effective the investment was, what was our, our return on that security investment. Um, so we, we were trying to anticipate uh, questions such as whether we were spending too little or, or too much and were we spending the, the money in the, the right ways. So normally we would have uh, tackled that with the traditional discussion based on conjecture and, and opinion, uh, but we, we decided that we would look to partner with EY and take more of a, a data-driven approach using economic modelling. Uh, and certainly with a view to improving that dialogue, changing the, the, the conversation, the language with the board and using uh, concepts and terms that they're familiar with, such as the, the financial loss exposure that, that we would have. 
um, for ourselves. We also wanted to have a, a capability of, of using modelling to look at our investment mix uh, and be able to confirm or, or better understand where we could spend the money to get the, the, the best bang for buck, the best return. Uh, and we were also looking to understand what our residual risk would look like, um, having spent all, all of this money investing and uplifting our capability, uh, and what the value of, of cyber insurance might be to us to uh, buy some cover against that residual exposure, uh, against those financial losses that we might have uh, in worst case scenarios. So I'll, I'll go uh, and, and provide a bit more detail into the, the how. So we applied a, a structured method, and I'll, I'll take you through some, of, through some of the steps today. So the, the first stage for us was to model um, some very, or identify some very credible scenarios for our business uh, to make it real. Um, and I'll give you an example of a couple that we identified. One was a, a distributed denial of service attack, uh, something that was uh, plausible um, and something that could happen during a, a very uh, critical business period uh, to cause maximum impact in our ability to service our, our customers. Uh, another scenario was a, a mass data breach. So those are just a couple of the examples. Um, so, and that was basically crafted by subject matter experts. So our chief information security officer, uh, security subject matter experts and, and IT executives uh, met as a, a small working group to narrow the field on uh, the, the most credible scenarios that we, we could use as a, a baseline uh, for this type of discussion. The next step for us was to then embark upon uh, a, a broader discussion with a, a wider community uh, of stakeholders uh, across our business value chain. So introducing the, the scenarios to uh, people that represent our front line, uh, our contact centres and our, our branches, uh, people from our corporate affairs, group legal, uh, regulatory affairs, um, people that are, are on the, the, the back office functions, that each might have a, a role to play uh, or may be impacted by uh, a, a cyber event. So the, the basic objective there was to walk through these scenarios uh, and be able to collect facts and validate assumptions around how this might affect all of those respective parts of our business, uh, either in terms of, of direct costs or indirect long-tail costs uh, as, as we would play out a scenario through the, the, the response and, and recovery. So the other... Part of this scenario was also, uh, and I'll take you through just an example of one of those scenarios that we would use in a, in a structured workshop. So we would walk through the, the whole, what we call the kill chain, um, and, and this example here, the scenario is uh, a, a mass data breach event um, where it starts with a criminal syndicate doing social engineering uh, to gather information that they can then use to craft uh, a well-crafted uh, phishing email to entice an employee to install uh, remote, remote Trojan software uh, that would ultimately lead to the, the attackers gaining access into our environment, accomplishing their mission to exfiltrate uh, large sums of data, uh, and then monetize that, so they've mission accomplished, but then also play through the, the rest of the sequence, right through the, the whole uh, response and recovery, the, the lingering impact to our business. And as we walk through these scenarios, uh, we also validate uh, for each of the respective business units how that might play out in the, in the context of their processes and their people. Uh, and we stress test that, what would be the, the, the minimum uh, uh, impact either in terms of, of lost hours of, of productivity or unplanned expenditure on, on things like advertising, uh, mail outs to customers, uh, legal costs, uh, regulatory costs and potential fines. So those are just examples of, of some of them are direct in terms of, of financial impact or indirect in 
in terms of, of lost opportunity or, um, or lost productivity. Throughout these steps, we also mo uh, make the assumption that it's not all bad, that we have existing controls in place to mitigate some of these risks. So as, as part of that, that discussion, that dialogue with the, the business and technical subject matter experts, we're able to look at the, the current state, uh, and in fact where we might have been two years ago even, uh, and capture those, those sorts of facts as well around uh, the, the controls that we've got uh, and the effectiveness and, and the coverage. So by and large, the, the, the discussion through these structured workshops is to collect uh, a heck of a lot of data and reasonably accurate uh, assumptions. Then working with EY, um, we then take a lot of those data points and, and put them through uh, mathematical uh, analytics. Um, in this case, we use Monte Carlo uh, simulations. So it's the same approach that we've used historically in the past in the banking sector for doing credit and, and liquidity risk modelling. Uh, so we've, we've basically taken a, a leaf out of that book and applied that to cyber economic modelling to then be able to run hundreds of thousands of, of simulations of the different permutations to provide the data that will then show what the, the, the low end of a loss might be in financial terms for a, a low impactful or a, or a short event right through to a, a less likely, what we call a black swan event. Um, that might seem unlikely but is still plausible. So we then work out what the range of, of loss might be um, and be able to do that at, uh, at, at mul multiple points in time. So in our case, we were able to run a scenario uh, at the start of our journey when we uh, were only just beginning our uplift program, uh, where we only had partial effectiveness and coverage of our, our cyber security controls. Uh, we're able to then run uh, an as-is or current state simulation that shows how effective we've been at reducing the likelihood and impact. And, and the, this graph is just a, a, a tool that's used to start that discussion with key stakeholders, such as the board and executive management, to really provide a, a data-driven view of, of how we've been able to change the dial on the financial expo the potential financial exposure that we've got. And then finally, we're also able to predict, based on our, our strategy and, and roadmap, um, where we uh, are hoping to be in, in one or two years' time. The other benefit here is that we can do what-if analysis as well. So if we get uh, challenged to reduce our budget, um, what effect might that have? Um, or if we want to change our investment mix and focus more on detection instead of prevention, then again, we can remodel uh, and, and run uh, the simulations to understand how that varies our, our loss exposure over, over time. So hopefully that gives you a, a sense of the, the, the method and the, the outcome. So the, the benefit for us, it actually has transformed the, the dialogue. So rather than providing traditional reports that, um, that boards really struggle to understand, uh, such as how we're undertaking vulnerability management in our, our technical infrastructure, um, statistics around awareness training, um, or statistics around incident response, we're able to ch uh, change that into uh, a dialogue that is in financial terms, uh, a discussion around what is our, our maximum loss exposure, what is our likely loss exposure uh, as well, so that we can then have a, a better and transparent view of how valuable the, the budget is in, in cyber risk management, uh, in, in improving our security controls, uh, and it certainly it helps us defend our budget as well, uh, because there's always an opportunity cost, and sometimes cyber security is, is seen as a, a grudge investment. Um, it's always competing against all sorts of other investment that uh, have a, a much a very strong ROI. So it is a necessary cost of business. Um, 
one of the, the spin-off benefits for us as, as cyber security professionals is the we were able to gain a, a much better understanding of how our, our business works. We were able to get out, outside of our little black box and, and talk to a, a broad range of, of business stakeholders. And the penny dropped for us. We had always just worked in our very narrow line of sight. The cyber security controls are the only way to manage cyber risk. And, I mean, it shouldn't have been a revelation, but it was to some of us. The, we we underappreciated the, the fact that the business as a whole is, is resilient and, and has many other types of controls. Business continuity plans, for example, media response plans were already in place. So we, I suppose it's reassuring to find that there was a, a lot of inherent capability and, and talent in the rest of the team, and we were able to build some of that into the, the model as well. Um, ultimately, we were able to calculate what the, the maximum loss exposure was, and we, we ran four different types of scenarios, and we're now able to rinse and repeat, run that on a, a periodic basis uh, to be able to demonstrate how effective we are at, at, at buying down the risk. We're able to finally demonstrate what a return on a security investment looks like. Um, and ideally, where that investment mix should be. So we've been able to get a, a much better understanding of, of where we don't need to invest anymore because there is a, a diminishing uh, return. So we're constantly looking to recalibrate our, our spend to make sure that we are getting the, the, the biggest bang for buck. And, and finally, the other uh, spin-off benefit uh, was just the, the process of engaging with a, a broad cross-section of our, our business stakeholders. It, it was the first time that we'd taken many of them through a, a simulation, through a, a cyber scenario. So. Ironically, it became a, a really fabulous uh, cyber education and awareness tool as well. So there were certainly a, a number of, of people across our business that didn't really understand what this was all about, didn't really fully understand um, that it is a, a shared problem. So I think that we've now got a, a very strong um, pool of people across the organisation that we can maintain a relationship with that understand the mitigating uh, the cyber risks is a, a shared responsibility and not just uh, an IT problem. So I, I think I'll, I'll just pause there and, and, and hand over. All right, thanks, Ian. Um, if you want to pass that over, Ian, uh, oh, to, you. to yeah. Brett. So we talked a little bit about, um, I talked at the beginning about the problem <clears throat> in terms of what we do today and how we need to improve upon that, how we can improve upon that in terms of the, the structured reporting. Ian's um, just talked us through um, so a real-life example of how we've applied that thinking and, and transformed the engagement with the executive and the board. But underpinning a lot of that, that capability is, is data and analytics. So we're going to get Brett to talk us through um, you know, how we use technology and how we use analytics to, to, to help enable that, um, that, that change in that discussion. So, Brett. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Ian. So, I think, as, I think you guys have done my job for me, to be honest. I just kept on hearing about data the whole way through, so I was, I was very happy with that. But, um, you know, the, the headline says it all. So, data underpins ineffective, effective reporting and management, but also risk mitigation. Um, and one of the really important things about risk mitigation is being able to link um, the uh, risk with an observation and some evidence that you've actually got to control. Um, and if you look on the left-hand side, as, as Anthony sort of called out, it's really important that you understand the sort of risks and threats that you're open to. Um, and in essence, these are, the, um, these are the sorts of use cases we're looking to build analytics around and provide evidence of. Um, and we're looking at that both from an operational perspective, trying to capture the underlying data, and you can see that um, you know, quite often the data is there. There is a huge number of tools available capturing data around um, your, your, your risks. And then turning that into something meaningful is the challenge. And the, the challenge often is solved through, through consolidation, aggregation, the words that you, you've just heard, but also around modelling um, and scenarios. So to do that, you know, that's, that's very much what an analytics platform is there to do. And so, so now we have platforms that are able to take all these different data sources from the many tools that are capturing 
operational information around cyber attacks. And putting that into one platform, one place, you know, sometimes called a data lake, where you can capture that information and start to look at individual events, and very importantly, look at that over time. Um, and it's when you look at that over time, you can start to see um, correlations of events, and you can start to see, in effect, a threat, and you can see that threat playing out across different, um, different um, uh, channels, in a sense, or different ways that, that, a, um, that, that's a, that somebody's interacting. So, you know, we talked about phishing as an example, and I'll go through that in a minute, but you can spot, you know, an observation of a phishing email, you can use that as evidence, and then you can capture that and put some analytics around it. So, the sort of thing we're trying to do is, in effect, build a platform in a, as, a, as a lake in terms of observations, but also then build up analytics and build up a model to provide a view of that. So, we heard about risk modeling. So, you can now deploy risk models that can be run and rerun. So, Ian was highlighting that when, they're looking, when, when the business is looking at risk, they want to understand how risk has changed over time. So being able to have those risks models embedded as part of the platform is an essential um, part of it, and then linking that to a, a simple dashboard that people can understand. So you can, if you look on the right there, um, you can see some examples of those dashboards. So at the bottom level, we've got the, an operational dashboard, which is kind of showing some observations around um, some of your controls being sufficient or insufficient. We move up a level, we've got some um, effectiveness, um, so we're looking at that over time. And then we can look at things like the resilience model. So this is where we're starting to create scores and looking at, um, in effect, the threat and, and, and the risk and assi assigning a, a score, and then linking that to the underlying um, you know, department or um, you know, being able to dissect that you know, very easily. And then at the top level, we've got the, the, the models that um, Ian was talking about where we're starting to look at um, the, the value of risk. So all of those, in essence, is built off, off the data, off the platform, and through, in, in essence, a, a series of dashboards and models that you're deploying on the platform. So if we go to the next slide, um, it is all about driving actionable insights and using reports um, that you can easily communicate to your stakeholders. So we touched on uh, some of the stakeholders in, uh, before, but in, in essence, being able to take an operational report or be able to take an executive report and distribute that to the different stakeholders is what allows those teams to work together to resolve the issues. Um, so if we look at the a scenario on the left, we talked about, um, in essence, a, a syndicate coming along, sort of starting a, a phishing attack. So being able to have an observation around, you know, some inappropriate emails, um, also to have some information around, you know, departments that have been, you know, well-trained or not, um, to, to look at observations, you know, in different business units around, you know, where those threats are occurring, allows you to actually see operationally um, how those cyber criminals are, are interacting. Um, and so then once that's detected, you can, in, in essence, assign a score or a risk. Um, and then you can start to look across others. So, for example, if somebody has used that phishing to grab a credential and that credential is being used in an inappropriate um, way um, or data is being exfiltrated, those are additional observations you can catch using some of the tools. So putting those together as like a time series analysis allows you to see that, hey, we've got some you know, instances potentially of phishing, we might have some... Um, inappropriate credentials being used, um, we have potential um, data exfiltration occurring, it allows you to create a case and investigate that formally. And you've got the observation, you've got the record, you've got the history. So that's, in essence, what an analytics platform provides. It provides a combination of a consolidation of all the operational um, information, it allows you to track the events associated with, with that, look at that over time, aggregate that into potentially a risk model, looking at a score that allows you to detect a potential issue, and then you're allowed to dissect that and pull that apart again and look at the actual observations um, and provide that as a case or as an evidence for further investigation. So analytics platforms aren't anything new, but they are evolving and specialising. So, you know, we do work with, you know, several of the banks to implement um, analytics specifically around cyber um, and, you know, managing risk around that. So. The big benefit is the automation. So there's a lot of data to collect, but it's not necessarily about having all the data. It's about starting with some of that data um, and using that to produce real insights and creating observations. So that an executive, when they do see a risk, you can tie that to an, exa an example and, and some evidence. If an external party is looking at it, so you can provide those insights you know, directly, you can reproduce that at any point in time. The second thing is around end-to-end um, uh, -end linkage to cyber risk. So as we talked about, I can take a, a simple 
sort of evidence from an operational perspective. You know, we, we spotted a, a phishing attack, but we can link that all the way up to a risk that you know, the board understands because we can say, well, that's occurring in this particular department. That department is you know, particularly a sensitive one and there's payment information involved. So you know, yes, that's a high, high, risk, high risk scenario that you know, the board would understand. Um, these tools, the analytics tools now, provide a lot of self-service um, around that data and around some of those models. So you can rerun the models um, and you can access the data. And what that means is if you're a cyber risk analyst, instead of spending all your time trying to get the data from these different points and different tools, it's in one place. So you're no longer trying to get the data. You're focusing on a hypothesis. You're trying to evaluate um, whether or not there is a real risk or if there's an additional um, set of rules that you want to implement. So you're spending your time on diagnosing and resolving or, um, rather than actually collecting data. Um, the third point there is around increasing, sorry, fourth point there is around increasing visibility. So um, if you're providing a dashboard and a dashboard and using a set of metrics as um, Anthony has called out earlier that the, the, the executives understand, then in essence you're um, providing a very simple sort of communication vehicle for, for expressing risk to your executive. Um, and last but not least, it's about centralising your cyber risk management. So um, by putting the data on one platform, it allows your teams to collaborate um, one place. So you, often you'll find cyber teams have different skill sets around looking at data loss prevention or identity management or, or different things. So when that data is available on one platform, you can then start to you know, use that information consistently, but also your teams can collaborate and resolve issues more quickly or work with other departments within a, within a bank to, to respond to an incident because the evidence is there. Um, so back to you, Anthony. Okay, if you want to pass it through. Ian, do you oh, want to pass thank it Thank you. All right, so we're actually surprisingly running ahead of time. This never happens. So that means we've got plenty of time for questions. But I wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit about the sort of key takeaways. So if you're going to go back to your, your businesses next week, what are the things that we'd like you to take from, from this session? And so I'll start with number one, you know, that we have to have a top-down view to complement the bottom-up um, data analysis that we've typically been doing today. And if you, if you focus on that, that top-down view where you're able to decompose that, um, uh, then you start to enable boards to be able to operate in the way that our regulators want them to. So certainly locally here in Australia, APRA, the Prudential Regulator, has, been, has really been focusing um, on, on trying to push the, don't just tell me it's okay, but show me. So using that top-down view um, and sp supported by some of the technology that Brett described, you can double-click and you can double-click and understand, well, so this threat, scenario is the one that's most impactful to our business. Where, which business unit do I have most exposure in and therefore who do I want to take the lead on trying to, to, to focus on reducing that? Um, if I go to that business unit, what are the controls um, that are the, the issue in us um, being most at risk in that business unit for this threat scenario? Where, which of the assets do we not have coverage on that I need to really focus on in the next six months to help us to, to get back into appetite? So you can really get very granular around where you want to take some action, where you want to focus your investment, so that it's not just one size fits all, which is often the way that we're, we're looking at it today. Second piece is around you know, using those those threat scenarios to bring the discussion to life in a structured way. So Ian talked about the way that we map out that, that threat scenario. We, if you work in security, you, you, you've heard the term kill chain before, which is really what are the steps that an attacker takes to do reconnaissance, to infiltrate an organisation, to, to move laterally, to identify where their, their, their target is, escalate their credentials, and then do whatever they want to do, whether it's exfiltrate data or whether it's to compromise a system, a payment system, or whatever it might be. So that's the, you can, you can map out the, the scenario that an attacker is going to play out. You can map the controls that you have to each of those steps. But you can then also look at the, the, the capabilities and controls you have in place that help you mitigate um, an attack should it occur. And we've seen, and there's evidence um, from um, events, cyber events that have occurred, that if you have a really good response and recovery 
capability, then you're able to reduce the impact on your business and therefore the value that you have at risk in a scenario. So it helps ensure that you've got full coverage of what you need to be looking at, not just how do we stop something from occurring. So I can't stress enough that structured scenario is fundamental to, to being able to get the, the model right. Number three, you know, data is key, and I'm glad you, you're appreciative of us talking about that, Brett, given, given your role, but, but don't let the lack of it stop you from starting on this. So uh, our hypothesis is, and, I, and, I, and I, we've seen this in action um, at one of, one of the, the banks that, to me, demonstrates it's true. If, if with that top-down view, if you need to measure something in order to be able to understand the risk and you can't measure it today, then that says something about your ability to really understand the risk. You know, what is your risk position? What is your, your view of your residual risk relative to posture? Comes back to my original point around opinion. Yeah, I think if we do this, we'll be in... We'll be in, we'll be in, in um, in, uh, back in our, our, our inappropriate posture or not. But so what, it, what, what demonstrating a lack of data allows you to do is to focus some of your investment on actually doing the engineering to get access to that information, to do the ex extracts of data from the whole plethora of tools that you have in place. So you're driving more value from your existing investments in those tools and you're really enabling um, a change in the way that you, you look at cyber risk and enable you to make real risk-based decisions. Because I would challenge most organisations are not making risk-based decisions. They think they are, but they're doing it based upon gut feel, opinion, and not based upon a set of facts. Um, lastly, I, 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 you know, we talk about automation almost in everything that we do, and I guess I want to I ground it in what we mean by that here, is a lot of the reporting... Um, that happens today are around um, cyber risk. A lot of the the, the sort of um, the calculation of cyber risk is pretty much done. You know, it's hand cranked. It's I'm ex I'm extracting data from here. I'm creating a, a a tableau dashboard potentially that I might take a snapshot of and stick it in a board paper or something like that. But it's not. They're not interactive, and they take a lot of effort to actually get to a point where you're able to, to generate some of those dashboards. So given that the, we have a challenge around data and given that we want to reuse as much of that from both an operational point of view and an executive reporting point of view, then, then thinking at the outset around how we're automating, how we're using technology to enable this is fundamental. Otherwise, one, the data will be out of date by the time you report on it. Number two, it's going to consume too many resources that you just won't, you won't um, follow through on it. So um, I'll stop there because we have talked a lot and um, uh, we've got some questions I, I can ask of the, the panel here. We've got about 15 minutes left. So like I said, we're strangely probably about five minutes ahead of schedule, but open to questions from the floor if there are areas you'd like to explore across the sort of three key things that we've talked about today. Yes, there's a question. We've got a, if you just don't mind, there's someone with a mic, it'll help. Thanks. The, the approach is very logical to me, and it seems to, to make sense. It's a good way to think about it. But I guess what I'm missing in, in terms of the lines there is especially if an audience of uh, financial institutions are broadly here at Cybos, you've got minimum requirements regardless of where you're starting. And that's one of the aspects that I think people are, are struggling with minimum in terms of what regulators expect. And again, that, that's just areas, right? Uh, privileged access management, right? You, you can't say that I, I don't somehow have a minimum investment in there before any of this kicks in. Mm. Um, mm. And that aspect of a minimum bar is always moving. Uh, and part of it is related to aspects of a type of peer analysis mm. yeah. uh, because your best scenarios here are, are, in some cases, based on what your assumptions are and the information that the industry is increasingly better sharing, right? So that we understand what those risks are. You can't just make these up. And so I, I guess to me, if I saw this as, as more useful, 
I would see it as really confirming that you have some minimum amount on the curve, and then it gets to a period where you, you start making choices and start prioritizing yeah. in there. Okay, let me start by, by addressing that. So <laughs> I, I think it will depend upon the regulatory regime you're working in. So if you go to, to Singapore with the, the MAS regulations that are there, they're very prescriptive, like you say, around what you need to do. So there is a, a minimum requ regulatory requirement regardless of the view of, of risk. In a number of jurisdictions where it's sort of more principle-based um, regulation, um, the regulators in our experience want you to understand your risk and make and focus your investment in those places. They, the, the they, they're open to the conversations around we know where our key risks are. We know what are the things that are going to mitigate those. We understand our critical assets that underpin our business, and that's where we're investing. So we're not investing, we're not putting in privileged access management in every system, even if it's of zero value and it holds publicly available information. You know, that's, that's the $5 million fence around a million dollar racehorse. So I would... I would argue, and I, and I guess our hypothesis would be that this analysis helps you to have a better conversation with your regulator around what you are doing and why, and therefore allows you to focus your resources in the most eff effective and efficient way. You know? and I, but I, I do, you know, that's clearly a, that's a nice thing to say. Your experience with your regulator will, will depend upon the jurisdiction that you're operating in. Any other questions? There's another one down the back. Thanks. Uh, look, that was really interesting. Um, one of the one of the reasons that uh, I think you drew a good crowd into this one was the the question, which was, <laughs> how do you put a price on cyber um, cyber security? And you talked about it a little bit, saying, you know, one of the questions that your board was asking, are we spending too much or too little? And help me understand yep. that that question. Um, were, you, were you able to, with all of the work you did, were you, were you able to inform those questions in the end? I'll well, let you I answer can, that, I Ian. Can take that. So, I mean, the answer is yes. So, um, we had a, a, a year-on-year budget that was set for us uh, to uplift our, our cyber security capability. Uh, and, and I think that we've been able to clearly demonstrate that it, it has made a significant difference to some of the, the bigger risk exposures that we started with, such as a, a mass data breach. So, ironically, for, a, for what is materially a, a small amount of money in our total uh, operational expenditure portfolio, we've been able to get a, a pretty strong return on, on that investment. Uh, and, and this is not just based, as it would have been in the past, on, on opinion. Uh, it's using the, the data and the modelling to be able to back that opinion up. So it's more a case where it can withstand that, that test of scrutiny from the board in being able to demonstrate that the money was well spent. And I, I might just add to that and maybe have a counter where I've seen where there isn't an ability to put the, a price on cybersecurity and where I think there's been inappropriate decisions made around investment. So, um, I clearly won't name clients. <laughs> that would be the, the wrong thing to do. But I've seen examples at, at um, uh, some financial services organisations where they are investing significant sums of, of money in, in security. And yet, we see the investment being very much focused on putting in new capability and not focused on where's the coverage of that capability, those controls, when I say capability, I mean new controls, the coverage of that across their critical assets. So, um, and we have shared an opinion, we've been asked um, to provide expert opinion on risk appetite and so on, and our position to the board has been very clear that the investment that you're making at the moment is in the right controls, but it's not in the right um, the right coverage, or the focus is not right from a coverage perspective, um, you know, uh, across the business. And, um, and, and we didn't have the ability, we didn't have this modelling in place, we ha didn't have the scenarios 
um, defined. We weren't asked to do that, and the bank weren't doing that themselves. So that dialogue, that was just a, you know, that was a, an observation of a problem, but we didn't, we had no way of quantifying it because we'd not had this, these sort of underlying structures in place. If we did, we'd very clearly be able to, to, to articulate what the impact of not investing could be. Um, and demonstrate what that investment would do in terms of reducing the, the, the risk to that business. Okay. I think another benefit that we found that I'll, I'll talk about is we were periodically asked uh, uh, by our, our chief financial office um, how much uh, liquidity do they need to maintain because they generally, like any large organisation, we maintain a degree of liquidity for unplanned uh, expenses for the unforeseen. Uh, and the question would often come up, do we have enough cover for a, a major breach? Um, and in the past, it was finger in the air. Uh, we would say, well, what would be the, the maximum uh, immediate uh, exposure financially for us to be able to respond and recover from a massive data breach? And we've been able to... Uh, find or prove that uh, we were overestimating, over-forecasting that in the past. So uh, now when we have a, a discussion uh, uh, about um, how much cover we need uh, from a liquidity point of view, um, we, we, we're able to give a, a better answer. So from that perspective, that means we're not having to have capital reserved for a, a cyber, well, not as much reserved for a cyber breach as we might have thought in the past. Mm. I'd just like to add to that with, um, we are doing a sort of project very focused on data security with um, some organisations and one of the things that they gave us as a challenge was, well, we can only spend so much money this year and next year, so tell me what controls I can implement that buy down the most risk. And so being able to link a control to risk buy down and um, dollars spent to, to, to resolve that um, is a really important decision. So in essence, we'll be able to link price um, of cyber to a control and to the amount of risk that it's buying down. Because you know, uh, you know, a security framework is quite comprehensive. You can invest in a lot of those things across a lot of parts of the organisation. But you know, um, not all things are equal. So um, spending money wisely is, I think, what it's about in the end. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think if you identify the risk scenario and then the solution takes time, how do you communicate that usually? Like you keep it within confidential level or you wait or you share it with the leadership board members or what's the best solution for that? So do you mean in terms of you might do some analysis and find you've got yes. quite a significant value at risk mm -hmm. and it's going to take you two years to... Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll share an initial observation. I mean, t to me, that's, you know, if you knew that, then that's... That's gold. Like, if you're the CRO, you'd want to know that. If you're the board, you'd want to know that. So, uh, uh, to me, that's not something you would hide within, you know, the CISOs, the office of the CISO or anything like that. You'd need to be communicating that through your appropriate risk reporting channels. But, but knowing that was the case, you know, might, might change some of the, the focus of, um, your investment, you may even target, and we've seen that with, you know, you, know, you may target reinvesting money or, or moving investment from even enhancing the business to protecting the business in this scenario because you've understood your real risk position and the potential uh, value at, at risk that you're, you're, you're running at the moment. I think I'll echo that. It, it is gold because it means that you're able to have a better discussion around whether you are in risk appetite or not. So, I mean, in the scenario that you suggest, if it's going to take long time to reduce that, well, then that's, that becomes a, a time and money discussion. So, do we accelerate the uh, remediation by spending more money and, and putting more resources to it to get back into appetite? But we can also model alternatives, compensating controls as well. So there, there's often options uh, available that may not be as effective but might be good enough to, to buy time as well. So we, we can model that. Yeah. And lastly, the only thing I would add to, to finish off that, that answer is, you know, if you know that, you might choose 
in the interim to purchase some cyber insurance to give you at least some sh sharing of, uh, of risk during that period. You know, at least then you've got some view of what coverage you might um, require. And we've certainly seen that as one of the, the sort of benefits of this is, you know, Ian mentioned in terms of, you know, they, they had a capital allocation for catastrophes and so on. They could cover that with their cyber risk within that, so they're effectively self-insuring. But you might mm -hmm. choose to, to seek some external insurance to, to provide some, some interim cover or even use that as, a, as, as something ongoing. Um, and you're confident in the, the value that you've, you've insured for. All right, well, I think we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy.